like to answer some questions if you have. Can you describe and talk more about the sound difference with energy? I think they're asking are you, the difference between sound and energy. I have been talking about the sound al already earlier. And I said the sound that really pulls us, the sound that connects us to our highest level of consciousness starts from behind the eyes and goes up. All energy starts from below and goes to the eyes. The six centers of energy are responsible for all energy experiences. The sound takes us into experiences of awareness, higher and higher awareness. It changes our level of awakening. And the awakening is different from having a kick or having a slightly uninteresting, unusual experience. The energy experiences are based upon a change of the experience of energy we are used to, but they do not lead to any higher awareness. On the other hand, the sound pulls us to higher level of awareness. If we are a drop of divinity and we merge in such kind with the ocean of God, then we lose ourselves <coughs> and come back down again. What's the point? Why did it happen in the first place? Carl stood on one leg for a thousand years and we have to endure the suffering of this world? Yes, we are indeed a drop of divinity. We are indeed a drop of the totality of consciousness. We are a drop of consciousness, individuated into a feeling we are one amongst many. We have created the experience of the many and become one amongst the many in consciousness. This question of merging in Sajkhand was a question that bothered me a lot when I was young. In fact, I was virtually giving up the spiritual path because of this concept that we are a drop of that ocean, ocean of total consciousness. We are separated. We don't know how long we have been separated. And our spiritual journey consists of traveling back and merging in that ocean and becoming one. I thought to myself, at least I am a drop. I know I am a drop. I am very proud of it. Supposing I go and merge in the ocean, I lose my entity. I lose my identity. I am nobody. I am a loser. And the ocean doesn't gain much by one more drop in it. It's a lose-lose situation. What kind of spiritual journey is this? The only mistake I made was, as many others make, I thought I was separated from the ocean. And I had to go and merge there. When I discovered the truth from within, I found I never left the ocean. I became a drop of awareness within the ocean. And my awareness expanded and I realized I was always the ocean. I never merged in anything. I discovered my true identity was the ocean. Temporarily, I assumed the awareness of a drop. Then it made sense to me. The spiritual path is to discover your true identity, which is the ocean and not the drop. So this is a good question because I had this question myself. Then the next part of this question is, why did it happen in the first place? I want to know what is first place. First place in time. Why did it happen in time? The truth is there was no time. When it happened, there was no time. Time was a much later creation. If I can say it later, again, I'm making a mistake. Because we think continuously in terms of time and space. The creation did not take place early or late. When does the creation take place? Now. There's no other time there. In such khand, there's only one time. It's called now. And the same now is this now here. It's not a different now. The now creation takes place now. Right now. And the past and the future are being attached to time and space and make us look like there was a beginning and there's a middle and there's an end. It's an experience being generated in now. Therefore, there was no first place. Secondly, why did it happen in now? Why did it happen that we who were the ocean, totality, should experience something so different and become individuated? Not only that, why should we, who in a state of everlasting bliss, 
which was a part of our nature, come into an experience with pain and suffering and opposites of experiences, day and night, light and darkness. Why did we do that? What was the big purpose of doing it? The big purpose of doing that was that we can appreciate what bliss means. Supposing we never had this experience, would we know what bliss is? Would we know what, could we appreciate anything that we really are? Don't you think it makes a big difference? A rich person who is always rich has never appreciated riches. Once he sees poverty, he appreciates his riches. A person who has never had pain can never experience what joy, a pleasure gives him. A person who never had any unhappiness cannot feel so happy with happiness. Our consciousness picks up its experience from pairs of opposites. So what we did was a very wonderful intellect, intelligent thing we did, that we created an experience of opposites so that we could better appreciate a state in which there were no opposites. And since there were no opposites, the whole experience of pairs of opposites became an opposite to our original state of no opposites. So we generated a strange way of experiencing our own ultimate state and appreciate it more than ever before. We like it ever before. There is nothing like coming into this experience and going back home and feeling, now we know what our home means. In fact, in the traditional way of describing such Khand, they talk of the one and the many being coexisting. That the one is also the many. But the many are souls. The one is totality of souls. The many souls there, not all of them are having the experience. A select few, a small number are having the experience and we are in that small group. We are having the experience of duality and pairs of opposites here. When we return home, which is to awaken up back to our true reality and see the many there, we dance with joy. We are so much blissful. And the others ask us, what's so special about it? Why are you, we are all in the same state of bliss. You seem to be dancing more. And we tell them, you don't know what you're missing. You never had any other experience to compare it with. So, you can define the cause, if any, of creation through many ways. I talked earlier of loneliness, how the many were created to overcome basic loneliness and the loneliness was overcome by projection of the one into the very form where the many exist, including physical forms, finding a perfect living master here and going back together and continuously having company and no loneliness. We solve the problem of loneliness by this creation. So there are many ways we can describe it. Now, he is mentioned about Carl standing on one leg for a thousand years. That's a nice story. When you can't describe something of an area where there's no language to describe it, we make stories. All mystics, all saints have made stories. They have used parables, they have used metaphors, they have used similes, they have made stories. If the story is only that the negativity that had to be created to create pairs of opposites. If positive thing, it can't be positive if there's no negative. So the positivity of consciousness had to be matched by a negativity of something else. The consciousness we have defined as soul. Totality of consciousness, totality of soul. Soul is the power that gives us awareness of everything. Everything created by awareness. And therefore, the soul, the oversoul, the totality of soul creates everything. What can we make as its opposite? We can't make another soul its opposite. That's just the same drama of the soul. We make a negativity which is not a soul and make the whole experience happen. What we call Carl is not another soul. Carl has no soul. Carl literally means time. Carl literally means the creation of space-time as we know it, so that becomes the opposite of soul, opposite of consciousness. Kal is merely a function. 
which creates the duality. Carl is not a being. We make it a being to write a story. Why we say that Carl stood on his leg for thousands of years is because when these stories were written, there were so many yogis practicing one leg in the river and standing for long times. They were considered to be very perfect yogis. They still done, they still do that. If you go to India, go to Haridwar, you see some yogis still standing on one leg in the river, practicing that kind of yoga. But since those yogis were very strong, strong yogis to stand on one leg for so long, and the longer they could stand, there was sort of a competition amongst them. And the one who outlasted all became the bigger yogi. So those yogis set up a standard that he could do so much, therefore he's very powerful. Now we want to show that the negative energy that was created through time was powerful. So we make a story that Carl stood on one leg. I'm sure he had no legs. <laughs> we can say time has a leg, all right. <laughs> then the time was created to create a situation, give it power so that it matches and becomes an opposite of the essential nature of consciousness, which then automatically becomes a positive. There can be no positive, there's no negative. Consciousness was not a positive entity unless there was a negative. So that is why these stories have been told just to show how the juxtaposition was made to enhance the experience of consciousness at all levels. That's what happened. Does the soul have an awareness of the DVD, the life cycles, prior to making the choice to leave Sach Khand and embark on the journey of karmic consequences? The question is, does soul have awareness of DVD? Indeed, all awareness is soul. There's nothing that can have awareness. If you don't have soul, no awareness. No awareness of any kind exists anywhere without a soul. Awareness is generated by your soul. If you don't have a soul, you have no awareness. Soul is consciousness. Soul is the root of awareness. All awareness arises from the soul. When you add something around that awareness, it's still the soul having that awareness. If you block the awareness by creating a wall, it's still soul having that awareness of a wall that's blocking it. Of course, the DVD was an awareness of the soul. It still is. Our life here is an awareness of the soul. The soul is being aware of what's going on here. There's nothing else to, that can pick up awareness. Only the soul does it. The question is, why did we make a choice to leave such Khand and embark on this journey of such conse karmic consequences? Yeah, it didn't, doesn't look like a good decision. Not from this end. <laughs> Looks like we made some very bad decision to come here. But if you were to say, why did you go and see a horror movie and spend $10 or $7 on a ticket? What would be the answer? What made you go and watch a horror movie with murders taking place there, with crime taking place there, and you go and watch it? What made you do it? You did it because it was a movie, not because it was real. That's why you spent your money to see it. When you go back and find the whole thing is a movie, nothing else happened except a projection of a movie which was not real. And you wake up and say, wow, what a great dream I had. The answer comes immediately that we did not make such a bad decision. Of course, if the decision was that let's go into a reality of a bad world. Let's go to the reality of evil. Let's go to the reality of all these negative things happening. Would have been a very bad decision. But if the decision was, let's project a nice movie and see what are the possibilities. And then say, thank God it was just a movie. Which is exactly what we will say when we wake up from this. It was not such a bad decision to have experience only through a projection only through a shadow. The, the projection that we are seeing, all karmic consequences are merely a projection. They are a hologram projected from an inner screen where we draw something a little bit and becomes a projected universe outside. 
but we don't know it. It's such an interactive movie. It's not like the movie we watch on the screen because the screen is away from us and we are sitting in separately in an audience. In this movie, we sit in the center of one of the actors. That makes it very different. If you were to take a seat outside and see a three-dimensional movie, I know three-dimensional movies are very interesting. You might have seen them. I saw one in, in uh, Disney World. In Disney World, they showed a movie with special glasses you wear, so they become three-dimensional and things look like coming right at you. And things come and people get startled. They forget it's just on the screen. There's nothing coming at them. It looks so real. In one of the scenes in that movie, in Disney World, there's a truck carrying mice, rats or mice, it's carrying those little animals. And somehow the truck opens up by chance and all the rats come out, running into the audience. And the whole audience screams. And when they come, they all lift their feet because they can feel them in their feet. It's only little air pumps that are put in the chairs there. When the air blows, you feel the feet, the rats are right there. And then they stink so bad. And the stink bombs are right in the chairs. They have created a virtual experience. And you can go and see it. It's a virtual experience. Everybody reacts like it's real. What happens to us? That we are watching a movie, we know this two screen, two different pictures are coming together, creating the illusion that it's real. The pictures have never left the screen. They're so far away. And we get so affected by that, that we scream. Why does that happen? Aristotle gave an answer to this question. He was talking about drama. Why do we watch drama? And why do we cry in a drama? Why do we laugh in a drama? He says that drama is not real. It's an act. Actors are performing that role. That's not real. But when we look at a drama or we look at a movie, we don't want to see it as a movie. We want to see it as real. Therefore, we do something to our mind which he describes as a willing suspension of disbelief. Translated from Greek, that's what he says. He says we willingly suspend our disbelief, we, suppose, we are supposed not to believe it's real. For that moment, we willingly suspend our disbelief and start believing it's real. Why? To get rid of our own excess of emotions that we want to identify with a show which is not real. So that we can get rid of the excess of emotions we have, which he calls a catharsis of emotions. He says we need place for that. He said, without a play, we would be a mess. The play helps us to get relieved. And the same thing is true of movies. I personally don't go to too many movies. But once I go there, I cry with tears in my eyes. I have hardly ever cried in my life. But I always cry in my movies. And my kids carry handkerchiefs for me to wipe my tears. I take it as so real. It becomes very difficult for me to distinguish which was the movie outside or inside on the screen. Because they are both movies. Once you realize that everything is a movie being projected for the sake of experience to consciousness, the whole picture changes. And you are never feeling the way we feel questioning right from here. We made very good decisions. How should we lead our day-to-day -day lives so that our meditations are better? best way to lead your daily life so meditation is better is if you are initiated to think of the master. Give credit or discredit to the master for everything that happens. It's not necessary always to praise the master. It's sometimes necessary to say, master, what happened to you? How could you allow this? Still remember the master. It's not always necessary that we should say, master is always kind. Sometimes he doesn't look so kind. Some of our experiences make us react. Master, are you still there? How could this happen? How could this accident happen to me? Where were you at this time? You're still remembering the master. Or you can say, thank you, master, for you found a parking spot. Thank you, master, for the good thing that happened today. And when something not so good happens, 
thank you master it could have been worse and i can see what could have been worse you really saved me from a worse situation any of these steps we take helps you in meditation in the morning just think of the beloved master and automatically your meditation will improve so make your daily events as part of your meditation think of the master repeat the words walking talking doing things where you can where you need some intellectual attention yeah put your attention there and then go back to that there was a guy named aladdin some of you might have heard a story because aladdin found a little bottle containing a genie and when he rubbed that lamp or bottle or something a genie appeared out of it huge big genie aladdin was frightened but the genie said master i am your slave you are my master because you opened me out from this prison house aladdin couldn't understand how such a big genie could be his slave he said if you are my slave go and this work for me go and build a house for me and genie went and built the house within a few seconds and came back yes master what next and aladdin said go and put a bridge on the river he made a bridge on the river and came back in a few minutes every order every command this little aladdin would give to the genie the genie carried out so quickly ultimately he couldn't think of any more commands then the genie began to give him commands now come on follow me i'll show you what i can do the slave became the master the genie took the aladdin all around and made him do things that the slave wanted the genie wanted and one of aladdin's friends came to him and he said you were such a happy go lucky fellow what's happened to you you are so sad and depressed he says i am sad and depressed because i found a genie he claimed to be my slave and i have run out of commands and now the genie is taking me all around and i have become his slave how can i be happy he says i'll tell you a way when genie talks to you what is your command master say bring a pole a wooden pole from the forest and dig it into my room in the middle so when the genie brings the pole digs it and says master what's your next command my command is go up and down the pole till i give you next command so keep the genie busy going up and down up and down and you need to get something done genie get off the pole and do that and he comes back up and down on the pole this is a story illustrating that the mind was our genie it was supposed to be our slave the mind was supposed to do what we wanted the soul wanted and the soul subjected itself to the mind to such an extent the mind is telling us all the time what to do solution let the mind dig a little pole of simran in our head when the mind says what next repeat the words keep on repeating the words when you need to do something where you need to put the attention take it off and say okay do this work after this finished go back on the pole simran keep on repeating till i need you again so the fact that we can hold the mind to do perform certain things with our own will the spiritual will not mental will the spiritual will over the mind then we put the mind in the right place the mind is supposed to be our servant so mind is supposed to be our slave mind is supposed to carry instruction that we give do we do that we allow the mind to tell us what to do and later on we regret because the mind doesn't know everything mind knows what what data we feed it and afterward we find that the mind doesn't know anything more so therefore to reverse this how does the soul give instruction to the mind without thinking without using the mind intuition coincidences circumstances they tell you what instruction to give once you're given instruction based on your gut feeling based on your intuitive feeling tell the mind to do that use the mind to carry out the instruction not to tell you what to do if you change this pattern of your life you will find you will always be in control of your mind and control of your life a good tip is it true that you asked the great master to take all of your karma as a condition for receiving nam if i had asked the great master to take away all my karma i would be dead <laughs> i would not be here without karma nobody is alive 
So I did not ask him to take all my karma. I didn't want to commit suicide. That would be the end of me if he took away all the karma. The karma sustained me. Karma is still sustaining me. What I did was to have a deal with the master. It was not a deal about taking away all the karma. It was a deal where I heard the master give a discourse where he said, Kaya Nagar, it was a chanting. Chanters chanted this verse and master explained what it means. Kaya Nagar, Nagar hai Niko, which is Sauda Har Ras Kijiya. That this body is a city, it's a township. Inside the body, there is a certain marketplace up above in the head. If you want to get real deals, go to that marketplace. You get the best deal. So I went to the great master and I said, I heard this discourse of yours that you can have a deal. Can I have a deal? He said, sure. I said, a deal means I give you something and you give me something. Isn't that what a deal is? A transaction? He said, sure. I said, can I give you all events that involve unhappiness, sorrow, suffering, bad luck, all that to you? And you give me all the goodies of life? He said, done. From that day, he kept his word, I kept mine. Because we followed a deal. I came to this country in 1962, was at that time so full of pride of this deal. What a deal I got. And I told some satsangis, followers of masters in this country, you know, I got a deal. We all can get a deal. That's the real thing to get from a master. Get a deal like that. And they told me, you are so unfair. You did a disservice to your master. How could you put all your bad karma on the master? And how could you get all the good stuff from him? They rebuked me, admonished me for getting a deal like that. And I kept quiet and I said, these people have no idea what a master is. These people have no concept at all what this human being is. If with one touch of his finger, he can take all of us to such cunt in one second. That's his power. What are we talking about? Being unfair to such a person? What are we talk? What have we understood about him? We don't know master at all. That we take him as an ordinary person. They have no idea at all that these deals are practical deals, and they work. Very few people get them. Why? Not that I was extraordinary to get it. Anybody else could have got it, but they would not have been able to keep it. If I say to the master, I give you all my bad karma, he says, okay, do I have reason to worry after that? Supposing I worry after that, I have not followed the deal. There's a condition automatically attached to this, that once I've given something, I can't worry about those things I've given. So if I kept on worrying about things which I've given to the master, deal fails. People told me, you know, that was a simple way you taught us. Let's try it. And they try the deal and they start worrying next day about what they've already handed over to the master. Master said, okay, take it back. <laughs> we'll work out next time. It's, it's not difficult to get the deal. It's difficult to keep it up. It's not difficult for the master to keep his part of the deal. It's difficult for us to keep the part of the deal. That we should be able to rely on the master to such an extent and have that kind of faith, that kind of belief, that he will take care of everything from now, I need not worry about anything. That kind of faith will make the deal real. If you don't have that, what kind of deal is it? Then you are not following your part of the deal, and the deal fails. So that's what I meant. I did not say take away all my karma. I said, let's have a good deal, and I can see, because in course of time I realized that master does not work from outside. That human being was not the one who did the deal. The master who makes the deal is inside. The master who makes the deal is projected of our own true self. And the deal is with your own self. The deal is to have faith and surrender 
with no question. If you can achieve that, you got the deal. Even if you talk to nobody outside. The deal is a deal on faith. The deal is about how much you believe, without doubt. How much unshakable faith you have. That makes the deal. And not what you converse with anybody. Conversation was not the deal. The deal was to keep up. He kept his word, I kept mine. If either of us don't keep our word, the deal fails. So that was the true answer about the deal. There were, it's all a question of faith. If our faith is lacking, the deal fails. This deal, this deal is for a state of mind, a state of being, a state of consciousness where we are able to surrender to the will of somebody who looks external to us but actually is our own inner self. It's very difficult with, with the kind of minds we have. It's very difficult. Now look at Western society. Look at United States. I come here and I'm carrying this deal with me. It works equally good here. It worked equally good in India. worked equally good all over the world. The deal is not dependent on where I am. The deal only says, trust your master, he'll do everything, and he does it. I come to a country where there is so much fear, paranoia, about a deal like this. Will anybody say, give your mind up entirely to another person to decide for you? So many cults have led to tragedies in this country. Gurus are at a big discount in this country. Because they are all considered to be creating cults and creating paranoid situations where they can lead people to disaster. And from all observations we see, there have been people who have led people to disaster, obvious disaster for us. How can anybody trust? When I came to the country in the 60s, one of the prominent words was think. All over the boards we used to sign the word think written up. Think, think for yourself. Don't make somebody else think for you. And here I am talking of a, of a deal where I make somebody else think for me. How will it work in this culture, in this society? It's not easy. We have been brought up differently. We have been brought up to not trust anybody. We have been brought up, be very careful. Everybody is going to be playing mischief with you. They are all going to rob you one day. They are all going to hurt you one day. We have been brought like this. Paranoia and fear exist in us all the time. Insecurity is part of our life over here all the time. I have never seen so much insecurity in any culture that I've seen here. Why are people so insecure? They are insecure about their future, insecure what will happen in old age, insecure about their finances, insecure about their health, insecure about their life. And all these insecurities lead to so much fear. They are afraid of meditation. They are afraid of deals. How can you talk of a deal in this background of upbringing and creating this kind of paranoia situation, a situation of fear? Deals, deal take place when you are a fearless warrior. Great master used to say, the true spiritual path, effective spiritual path is not meant for cowards. It's meant for brave warriors who are willing to face their own mind, who are willing to overcome their mind and fight it out and stay with your soul and not be misled by their mind and its doubts and its fears. Did you know that the fear and doubt is only a function of the mind? Their soul has no fear and no doubt of anything. So long as we identify with the mind, we are afraid and we have doubts. The moment you disassociate yourself and make the mind your slave, all fear disappears and all doubts disappear. That's the spiritual path. We are supposed to Separate ourselves from the mind. Realize we are not the mind. We are souls empowering the mind to function. And therefore, when we separate from the mind, our strength comes back and fear goes away and doubt goes away. There is such a clarity available through the spiritual path that everything becomes falls in place. No confusion, no doubt, no fear. It is doubt that is the creator of fear. Supposing you have no doubt, you, you will see you lose fear also. I have found only those who are able to practice the meditation to the extent of not being dependent on the mind, realizing the mind is not their sense. 
are totally fearless and doubtless. And that's one of the benefits you will get from meditation if you practice enough to see the mind is not yourself. It's just a thinking machine. It's just a thinking, reasoning machine attached to consciousness. It's attached to the soul. And we are misusing it. We are making it decisions for us. We are being led by it. Let us not be mistaken. The mind is not ourselves. And if we are not the mind, we can make a deal like the kind I made and it worked. It will work for anybody. Thank you. Thousands of people claim to suffer from tinnitus. Is this a disease or are they hearing the sound current? <laughs> tinnitus? Or how do you pronounce? Tinnitus. Either or, but tinnitus is the... Tinnitus or tinnitus? Tinnitus whatever is the actual Whatever, whatever the pronunciation. It means hearing sounds in the ear. All kinds of sounds, very unpleasant sounds. I've never found a pa patient suffering from tinnitus enjoying it. It's a bothersome thing. It's a disease. It's a sharp, hurting sound. It's a sound that displeases you. It's a sound that puts you off. It's a sound that bothers you. It's a disease. But the sound of the bell is so mellow. It comes inside. It's so melodious. It pulls you. You enjoy it. It's totally different. Don't mix up the two. One is a disease. The other is the sound of consciousness inside. And the experience is totally different of the two. If you have shrill sound, shrill sound coming in, see if you can find some treatment for tinnitus. Good enough. You have stated that our current lifetime is like a DVD. Everything is already written, predestined. Therefore, is our free will only an illusion? Do we really have free will? Depends from which level we speak. Here, we have free will. Why? We feel it. We practice it. We use our free will every day. How can you deny it? A friend of mine, again I'll tell you a true story. A friend of mine at Harvard University one day discovered, Eureka, we have no free will. And his reasoning to come to that conclusion was a religious one. He found that God, the creator of all of us, is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. Omniscient means knows everything. So he reasoned, if God knows everything, how can we do something which he doesn't know? And if he knows what we are going to do, how do we have free will? There can be no free will if God knows. If we really have free will, and we can take a step that God doesn't know, then he is not God. He is not omniscient. Based on this argument, he came to the conclusion he has no free will. So he called me in the morning, early morning on telephone. I found out we have no free will. I said, come and meet me in my apartment. And I played a trick on him. I prepared a tray with a cup of coffee and a cup of tea and an empty cup. When he came, I said, would you like to have coffee or tea or nothing? I got all three ready. And don't use your free will. You don't have any. He was stumped. He says, all my great knowledge you have destroyed with a cup of coffee and tea. I said, I am going to prove to you not only that you have free will, that you cannot avoid free will. Whether you like it or not, in making any decision at this moment, you have to use your free will. What makes you think you have no free will? Your free will is being examined right now. You can't make any decision, yes or no, without using free will. Free will is real. He got stumped. What about God? I said, I'll explain that in a, in a little while. At least I prove to you, you have free will. Not only that, you're trapped into free will. You are a slave of free will. That whether you like it or not, you are making decisions. You're forced into making decisions. Your life presents options. You can go either way. You have to use free will. What are you talking? There's no free will. Have you been completely confused? I said, now I'll tell you, you have no free will. And I'd explain it very simply, scientifically. 
And the scientific explanation is that when I offer you coffee or tea or nothing, <coughs> how do you decide what to take? It looks to you that in your head, you are saying, okay, tea, coffee, coffee, okay, I'll take coffee. You made a choice. How did you make a choice? If you look at the factors that allow you to make a choice in your head, you will notice there are only two sets of factors that make you choose anything in life. One, your genetics, hereditary. Maybe your dad liked coffee, your grandfather liked coffee, it's in your blood, and you like coffee, and you chose coffee. The second set of factors are environmental. You might have been living with coffee drinkers. You got acquired taste for coffee, and therefore you chose coffee. Do you realize that there is no third factor making a choice? Did you know all free will that we exercise is based upon these two factors in choosing? Choice making is not as arbitrary as we think. When we make a choice, we are being governed by only these two things. And when you make a choice, both of those are fixed. You can neither change your identity or your genetics, nor can you change your environment through which you have come. Therefore, whether you like it or not, you could only make one choice through free choice. And that was drink coffee. Which means it looks to you, you experience it like it was free will. Really, there was no free will. I could have seen your factors in your head earlier and written out, you will choose coffee after free will. This is the kind of free will you have. You really have no free will. But you have experience of free will. There's a big difference between having free will and experience of free will. You only had experience of free will, but not free will. Did you really have no free will? Now let's see. Who had the will then? Who decided to make you like this and you decided to use your free will to take that decision? Who ultimately wrote up the DVD? Who is the ultimate author of all creation? God. Totality of consciousness. Who is that? Have you seen that person? Have you seen that power? Go on and see it. Go in and watch. Who has written up the whole DVD? Who wrote up the free will that you exercise today? Today, Who wrote up that you will choose this with your free will? When you go to the top, you find you wrote it yourself. Surely you had free will because you wrote it. It's your free will at that moment, experience of free will at this moment, and no free will anywhere in between. Not easy concept to understand. That at one point in consciousness, all things were written by the same self. The free will experience of free will is being experienced by the same self in two different states of being, in two different states, levels of consciousness. In totality of consciousness, free will was used to write everything. In the play out of consciousness, in the physical plane, it looks like we have free will, but we are doing exactly what we wrote there. So it is our free will. But at this time, we don't know. It can be pre-written. At this time, we don't know that all we decided at that time is already programmed into DVDs, already programmed into pre-written destinies. And now when we exercise free will, it looks free to us. We can read the DVD. It was not free. We go up. Who wrote the DVD? We wrote it. So it was free. So it's a, it's a wonderful mixture of things. I could prove it either way. You have no free will. Or I can prove it was your will because you wrote the whole thing. Depends on the level of consciousness where we are. It's a very interesting subject, this free will. How we experience it. Why was it introduced? If everything had been pre-programmed, why didn't we go for a ride into life? We go into a carnival and jump on the... What are those things called where we horses go up Merry and down? Merry-go-round. Merry-go-round. We sit on a horse and go very round. We enjoy the ride. We have no decision how to make the horse run. We have no decision at what space to move. The show goes on. We enjoy the ride and come home. Why couldn't we have that kind of a life? Why did we put the system that we should experience free will, choice making? Why was it introduced into our life? It was introduced as the trigger to go back home. It was introduced so we could become a seeker. The experience of free will, no matter real or unreal, 
led to the experience of seeking, no matter real or unreal. It was a great arrangement that was made, that we can seek and find, and we can only seek and find if we feel we have free will. And the experience of free will was generated for that purpose. And the whole perfection of consciousness and its story comes up only when you see it from the top. Seeing from any other level is imperfect. Sorry we have to end. We'll continue tomorrow.